So I guess from now on every day, I tell you to schedule your oral final in the link uh, on Moodle, in the announcements, in the last announcements. Go do it if you haven't done it. All right. Um, so believe it or not, good for you. No one will take your time slot away from you now. Uh, believe it or not, we're, I'm seeing the light at the end of the tunnel. The, the light is section 5.3. And today we're finishing 5.2. And the light at the end of the tunnel is what happens when we stop summing the areas of tiny rectangles. Uh, but today, I'm going to talk about the properties of summing the areas of tiny rectangles, um, which is another word for integrals. Why am I on, on slide four? So, um, uh, let me remind you what an integral is. Um, The integral of a function. Um, it's the limit of the Riemann sums. The Riemann sum is the sum of the areas of tiny rectangles. And there's n many of them. And each one has height, the value of the function somewhere. I'm just going to go with the endpoints, the right endpoints of the um, of the of the interval, and then I multiply by the base. So this is the the base. This is the the height of the right endpoint. And the interval AB is split into uh, n equal pieces. All right, areas of rectangles. So um, the first thing I should talk about is what happens if f is negative. So then I'm sort of lying when I say the integral is an area. Um, if f is negative, it's not really computing an area, but it's better uh, because it's computing negative an area. Um, when you multiply delta x, well, the height times the base, like I was doing up there, <clears throat> then this becomes negative. And this is still positive. Uh, because remember, it's the length, it's the length of the interval, which is a positive number, divided by n, uh, which is a positive number. So this is negative, then you get, so the integral is going to be negative, but this is um, negative the height of a rectangle now. If you have your function here, and here is xi minus one, xi, the 
the the length of this segment over here is negative the value of the function because the value of this function itself is negative so to make it positive you need to put a minus sign in front um so this is this equals um negative b area so when you take an integral of a negative function you take negative the area of the approximating rectangles um and that means at the end you're going to get negative the area between the function and the axis so if that is negative the integral is negative the area now the area is over the graph so um if you have your function here this this is of course an area is always positive but the answer i get for the integral um is is uh, that area with a minus sign so an integral still allows you to compute the area just do the integral and put a negative sign in front um So what if what if f is sometimes positive and sometimes negative? Well, um, if you have a function. Like the sign is not the sign, but then, well, you're going to have some area over the, the axis, some area below it. Uh, what happens if you think of, of these rectangles that you would draw here? Here you're adding the areas, here you're subtracting the areas. So in the end, the integral of the function equals um, the area over the x-axis minus the area under it. So you would get a, a positive number or a negative number depending, that's not how you spell that, uh, depending on whether the area above or below is bigger. If there's more area, like here it looks like there's more blue area, this integral would be positive. <clears throat> right, are there any questions? It's not right. So um, something that you might have um, you might have figured out is is true days ago. So this is this is hard to prove. Um, so let's not. I don't even know if the book bothers uh, proving it. But the theorem is that we can integrals exist. Um, 
kind of along the lines of um, all the functions we know are continuous. Um, integrals, this limit that we're taking when we take an integral um, exists and as we and if we change what what points in the interval we, we put here we, we're going to get the same answer like we should and that happens for example as long as you take a continuous function if f is continuous on a b or even even i can let it have some discontinuities um Remember, jump discontinuities are the ones where you have limits on both sides, but they are different. Let's continue. Yes. Um, F is integrable, meaning uh, the limit of the Riemann sums, writing zero, the, the limit exists, and um, we get the same answer. for any choices of um, x i star in the interval, in the i interval, in the division of, of the interval a, b. So, um, I mean, this is just peace of mind that we're not talking about a thing that doesn't exist. Um, And and then we can make um, we can make every choice we would want. I get I get even like it's never gonna matter. But you don't even have to divide the interval into equal pieces as long as you as long as the pieces as long as their length approaches zero, you should be good. Um, not that we not that we need to care about that. And this this works if the function is continuous, and but also if the function looks like this with some jumps the integral is just going to be well the sum of this area and then this area and then this area so maybe it's not surprising that you can have jumps all right so um that's kind of it <clears throat> uh we we'll move on to properties So, um, properties. So here's a, well, here's the thing, here's the thing that's convenient to say. Um, normally we would say that A is smaller than B. Um, If I write, if I'm writing the the interval a v, but I could maybe I could write the integral in the other direction. And uh, either you can say either by definition. So so now you're sort of you're going to the left, you're going from B to A. 
so if you take so before I divided the the inter the interval I was making a be the first division x zero to x n and this was x zero plus delta x or a plus delta x a plus two delta x. Remember that delta x was a step we were taking. And delta, the the length was the total length divided by n. So now um, I have now let's say. I changed my mind. I want to say A is uh, bigger than B. So I'm still going, I'm going from the bigger number to the smaller number. We have A over here and B over here. And we can still say I have um, like all in A, A x0, B x n, and then everything in between is X, x1, x2, x3, but but now I'm going from right to left. And the length, if I'm still saying it's b minus a divided by n, this is now negative. And this means that this is still <clears throat> a plus delta x, because now a plus delta x means I subtracted something. So the picture works exactly the same, um, except now I'm I'm summing uh, the function somewhere, and this this is negative. So what we get? So if we if we just Think of going to the so we can just think of going to the left as, as taking a negative sign. Much like when things are going down, we also call them a negative height. So this is negative the the interval, the integral from B to A. Which is just nice. It's just pleasant to say we can switch the order and we will get a negative number. But if you follow the formulas, you would get uh, the just the opposite as well. So it's consistent with what we're writing. So if you do this, um, <clears throat> so what do you think is going to happen if I have an interval from A to B or from I guess I have an interval from A to C, and I put a number B in between. What do you think is going to happen if you integrate from A to B, and then you add the integral from B to C? So if you have your function. Um, this is the integral from A to B. This is the integral from B to C. So what happens if I add the red area and the blue area? Yeah. 
Intro from AOC. Yeah, uh, exactly. So this is, this looks, it looks like a strange formula, but it's just saying if you put two shapes together, their areas had. Uh, so this is, this is probably useful. Um, and a nice thing is that if you if you use this thing that I just said, that if you solve the order, you get a negative sign. Um, then this formula works. Even if we don't, if we, if they're not in order. What am I doing? <clears throat> you can think of what if A and B, B were flipped, then one of the areas would be negative, and I would be talking about a difference. And, but I mean, there's six ways to order them, and they all they all work this way, and they they all boil down, of course, to adding two shapes and their areas add. Also, um, a silly observation, what if A is equal to A? What is this? Um, what is this integral? You split the inter the interval into rectangle into equal length intervals, and then each interval you make the base of a rectangle. You have the areas of all the rectangles. I mean, would that be like infinity or like zero or? I think it would be zero. Um, it's the area. So in a picture, this it's the area of, of a line. Um, so, so this is just zero. Uh, the integral from, from A to A is zero, whatever the function is, whatever A is. Um, also, one silly reason why this is true is that I said if I interchange the top and the bottom, I get a negative sign. So here, even if it doesn't look like it, I interchange the top and the bottom. The thing is, if you interchange A with itself, it doesn't look like you did anything. So this means you get a number that is its own opposite, and there's only one of those numbers. Um, it has to be zero. OK, so that's what happens when you add the intervals together. Um, so what happens? when you add the functions together, uh, the answer might not be surprising. Wait, so like, uh, this is one of the properties of like, uh, intervals, integrals? Yeah. So like, uh, so like in the situation, just like adding these two integrals together, is just equivalent of like A to C. Mm -hmm. so, uh, so could we just like skip that and just say like A to C and calculate that or? Well, you could, if you wanted to explain it, you could say by the properties of integrals, you could write this formula, you know, you could write, if you wanted to explain what you did, you could say, you write down for any function and any three numbers, the integral add, adds like this. This doesn't have a name. Um, 
just the fact that integrals add over intervals. But, uh, but like, so if like, uh, on like homework, you don't need to give a problem like this, we have to tell you that we can just do like the integral of like A to C of like F of X or whatever, because of like, you know, adding, um, like sections of the integral. Sure, you want to call it that. You can call it that, yeah. Okay. Okay, uh, so this is going to look a lot like properties of derivatives. Um, what happens? So, what happens if you take the integral of a constant? Well, I can tell you what happens. Um, you could figure this out both drawing a picture and looking at the area and doing and writing out, writing out the Riemann sum. So if you have a and b here and you have the function y equals c, well, the thing about a constant function is that its graph is a horizontal line. So I'm looking at the area under a horizontal line. And that's called a rectangle. And if I, if I try to do the integral, that means split the rectangle into smaller rectangles and add the area together. But that is just computing the area of the rectangle anyway. So the answer, um, the answer to this integral is the base times the height. And the base is the interval a b. Um, And the interval AB has length B minus A. And the height is the height of the line. So the height is C. And then that's the integral of a constant function. And if C happens to be negative, here we would get a negative number, which would make sense because I said we should get a negative the area of the rectangle. And that's exactly what we would get. So this is the integral of a, of a constant function. So what happens if you add two functions and you try to integrate them? What do you think is gonna happen? Do you separate them into their own integrals? And what do you do with each of the integrals? Add them. Yeah, that's what's going to happen. Thank you, Adam. So the integral of the sum is going to be the sum of the integrals, um, which is fantastic. I love it when that happens. Um, so this is might be a bit harder to visualize. Uh, let's try. So take um, take this function. Um, so let's try to let's try to take this function and and this function. So uh, according to this, the area under the, so the red area 
to, uh, together with the blue area added together, this should be the same as the area under the this function, which is a sum. No. <clears throat> Oh, what are you doing? Um, so the um, so here um, the dotted line is the sum of the two functions, and supposedly the area. Under under the dotted line is the sum of the the blue area and the red area. So the red area is the whole is the whole triangle. Um, so do we believe this? I, I don't. I'm not sure. Um, you could let's see. So if I go like um, so the question I guess is if I move if I move this area so this is the area under the parabola now I add x to the function which means I put it over there uh, does this have the same area do you believe that I don't I don't know I think I probably do Um, you know why I believe it? I believe it because um, if I think of putting this into slices, this is the same length before and after. At least it should be. The length of, of this is x squared every time. So if you have two shapes where every every vertical slice has the same length, they should have the same area. That was um, it's called the Cavalieri's principle. I don't know. It's true. Um, and this is a lot easier to see in the if you write down the formula than if you do the then if you do the picture, you do the picture like you saw, it's kind of, eh, does it work? I don't know. But if you write down the formula, this is um, the limit of, oh yeah, I'll write out the Riemann sum. So f plus g, so the function times the, the function uh, at a point times the increment in x all the way to the function evaluated at the final points. So this is by by definition, this is the this is this integral. So now I have a bunch of um well, this is begging for me to use the distributive law. So if you just distribute all these products of delta x times the sum, I have I have something that looks very familiar. Just um look at the things they have in F. And this is the Riemann sum for F. And what's left, it's the Riemann sum for G. And now using the limit law, I can split this into two limits.
and each of this limit is exactly uh, the, one of the integrals. So I don't know if the picture is convincing, but the algebra definitely is because all I used was the distributive property and the fact that uh, I can take, uh, I can split a limit over a sum. All right, so, um, so the next ones are very similar. So what do you think happens if you multiply a function by a constant and then you integrate it? So you have your function something like this. And there's some area. And then if I do y equals two f, for example, then the the function becomes stretched twice in the vertical direction. So it's gonna look like this. So what's the relation between the new area and the small and the previous area? So you have you have a triangle and it has some area. And then you make it twice as tall. What happens to the area? The height increased by how much? The height, if, well, I made it twice as tall, the height increased by the, the height doubled. So what happens to the area if the height doubles? So I have a shape here, it's made of squares. It has an area of six squares. Increased twice, all right. We didn't have to draw the squares. Thank you, Adam. Oof, let me see this one again. Uh, yeah, you, you, you stretch something twice in this direction, the area doubles. <laughs> So you, if you multiply the function by two, it doubles. If you multiply by C, then the area gets multiplied by C. So the constant that is multiplying can just come out of the integral, uh, which, well, the same happens with the derivative. So you, you take a function, multiply it by three, um and you can and and that's the same as multiplying the integral by three. So for example, if I wanted to compute the integral from zero to one of two x squared plus one, um Using the fact that the integral splits over a sum, this is the sum of one integral and the other. And now the the constant can come out of the integral. So this is the integral 
twice the integral of x squared. And now this is the integral of a constant. So the integral of C is uh, the height times the base. So in this case, this is one, which is the height times the base, which is one minus zero. And well, this integral, this was one third. Um, I did this uh, on Wednesday. So uh, this is two, two times one third plus one. So um, I can do some more integrals now with these simple properties. I can pull my nose. And finally, just combining these together, what will happen if I if I subtract two functions and and then I try to integrate them? This is very easy to guess this is the furthest thing from a trick question you could imagine it's just exactly what you would think so what would you think the difference in integrals the difference of integrals yeah thank you adam uh and with what i know now i don't even need to i don't even need to work to to get this um this is any difference I can write as a sum. And I know I have a, a rule for the integral of the sum. And to go from here to here, I can use that the integral of negative one times g is negative one times the integral of g because constants come out and that's it so um integrals are nice with multiplying with constants and summing and subtracting and not at all with products um just like um just like derivatives All right, um, so those are, that's what happens when you, um, so these I would say, tell you that the integral is linear. Um, other properties that you can have, and I'm gonna just finish with this and then Monday we can get to the good stuff, um, is um, if a function, <clears throat> so you've already seen, If a function is positive or zero, then the integral, so this is an area. So the integral is positive. So this seems like a very silly observation, but it gets you a long way. Um, so you can sort of, you can squeeze integrals in a way that in a way that you can squeeze derivatives um i guess you gotta go with what the book says and call these comparison properties so what happens if you have a function that is bigger than another? Well, what's gonna happen? Uh, 
is that the integrals also um, the integral of the bigger function is bigger, uh, and well, a lot of ways to see this. You could subtract them, and then you would have f minus g, which is positive. Um, you use the fact that the integral of f minus g is positive because the inside is positive. Um, or you can you can draw a picture if f is bigger than g that means that the graph of f is above the graph of g so the area under the graph of g is going to be contained in the in the area under the graph of f the integral the integral of f is going to be the most the integral of g just because they're, they're both areas and one one shape is containing the other so this is a property that integrals have that i, I haven't told you anything remotely similar to derivatives because nothing like this works if you uh, a function uh, two functions uh, you can have a function be bigger than the other and who knows what happens to the derivatives if a function is positive the derivative could be positive or negative it could do anything at once it's just I mean, it's your homework, right? One A is writing a positive and decreasing function, which definitely does exist. Um, but but integrals, since integrals are areas, and I can draw this sort of picture. Um, the integrals compare like functions do, which um, makes integrals. Uh, a lot nicer in a lot of ways. Um, okay, so another thing that happens is say I knew I know the minimum or the max and the maximum of a function. So um, I'm just calling them little m and big m. Or even if I don't know the minimum and the maximum, just a bound, I know I don't know what the maximum is, but I know f is a most 10 all the time. Then what happens is that the integral is between two numbers. So you can use you can figure this out by the previous property because m little m and big m are constant functions. And you know the integral of a constant. And also you can see this. Um, uh, by drawing a picture. So if you have your graph. Uh, if I'm saying that the graph is bigger than m the little m, that means that it's above this horizontal line. And if I'm saying that the graph is smaller than big, uh, the function is smaller than big m, that means that it's underneath the other horizontal line. So um, the integral, again, we're just looking at shapes that are contained in each other. This is the area of yellow polka dots. So the the region, so this is a rectangle now because this is B minus A, this is M. The area of the small rectangle, which is M times B minus A, is smaller than the amorphous area in between, which is the integral of F. And that, in turn, is uh, smaller than the biggest area, which is the rectangle with the yellow polka dots. 
so this, I mean, this comes from the Elder Road for already done, but it also, it's also very clear in a picture. All right, so um, that's that's all the properties I wanted to say. And next Monday, Monday we get to the good stuff. I want to remark that even though the definition of the integral looks very miserable, it looked very complicated, we can, we've, we've not a lot of work today. We've learned a lot of things about integrals. Um, we use this to compute a bunch of different integrals. Uh, so I guess the more of these th things are not as complicated as they look. All right, and that's it. And I'm going to stop recording.